Could it be that the USA copied Korolev's lunar space module? What trials did Korolev have to go through before bringing the USSR to the forefront of rocketry? What mistakes were made in the Soviet lunar program? Watch for more details. Sergei Pavlovich Korolev was born in the Ukrainian Soviet Republic in Zhitome on December 30, 1906. Already on June 28, 1908, his family moved to Kiev. This was due to his father getting a job as a Russian language teacher at a gymnasium in the city. In essence, he was raised by his uncle. In 1911, Sergei Utechkin, one of the first Russian pilots, visited the city. It was then that Karolov first saw a real airplane with his own eyes. This event undoubtedly influenced the boy's future destiny. He became interested in aviation, reading books on the subject. Karolov was a fan of the great scientist and dreamer Tsiolkovsky. As it is believed, he borrowed some ideas from this scientist for rocketry in the future. Having graduated from high school with honors, Sergei was obliged to obtain a professional qualification. Therefore, he joined the Society of Aviation and Aeronautics of Ukraine and Crimea, which was located in the city of Kharkiv. He went on to pursue higher education at the Kiev Polytechnic Institute in 1924. Then, in 1926, he transferred to the Moscow Higher Technical School named after Bauman. Even when studying at school, Sergei demonstrated his design abilities, studying books and creating airplane models. While studying at the Kiev Polytechnic, he and his friends built the K-5 glider in 1926. It was the first glider designed by Korolev. Later, he and Elushin, future aircraft designer, modified this model and named it Cocktebel. They tested it and flew it. There is even a photo of Sergei sitting in this glider. It's hard to say what can be considered the starting point of his career. Either the first glider project or work under Tupolev in the technical school, or maybe creating a public organization in Moscow called Group for the Study of Reactive Motion in 1931, which by 1932 had evolved into a state scientific and design laboratory. And on August 17, 1933, there was the first successful rocket launch. In the 30s, he worked on wing rockets, anti-aircraft with a powder engine, and long-range rockets with a liquid engine. Today we know that creativity requires maximum freedom, but Stalin thought otherwise. He preferred to keep scientists and engineers under guard in prison-type design bureaus. The same happened to Karolov. First, he was arrested in 1938 and broken in terrible conditions, where he was on the brink of life and death. Initially, he was tortured, his job broken, and then he was sent to a mine in the Magadan region. According to witnesses, when he lay exhausted in weak consciousness, he was transferred from there to a prison-type design bureau. He was lucky that the Soviet authorities suddenly realized that, in addition to cannon fodder, brains were also needed to win a war. Yes, in fact, the war for the USSR began in 1939, when it attacked Poland, and in 1940, when it attacked Finland. In those years, the Soviet army had more weapons than Germany and all of Europe except England combined. Therefore, brains were needed for the development of more advanced weapons. In prison, Sergei Pavlovich worked under the leadership of Tupolev, who was the same prisoner as him. There they worked on the Pet 2 and 2-2 bombers and a rocket interceptor. Later, Glushko helped him transfer to another design bureau to work on rocket engines. Glushko was also a prison inmate and worked on rocket engines. In those times, everyone was imprisoned. Somehow, in America, Sikorsky asked Tupolev if he was right to be scared of repressions and leave. Tupolev replied that it was in vain, and later he himself was imprisoned. Korolev was only released from prison slavery in 1944. Apparently, it was concluded that his will was completely broken and from now on he would be tame until his death. In principle, they were not mistaken. When Germany was defeated in World War II, the victor countries exported all of its developments. Already in 1945, in the USSR, a special design bureau was organized for the reverse engineering of the German V-2 rocket. Incidentally, in the Soviet Union, this field was very developed. Everything was copied. Tanks, engines, cars, airplanes, rockets. But to be fair, it should be noted that all leading countries had reverse engineering departments. Starting in 1959, the USSR demonstrated its achievements at world exhibitions. American intelligence was confident that the Soviets were carrying a model of a spacecraft, but a more detailed examination of the exhibit at the exhibition itself shocked them. For some reason, the Soviet Union was displaying a real working apparatus. The CIA then launched a real operation aimed at examining this module. And so, during another transportation of the exhibit, agents stopped the truck on its way to the railway station. 
Their task was to completely dismantle the spacecraft in a few hours, study it, take measurements, and make as many photographs as possible. The leadership of the US intelligence services was very surprised that the USSR did not lie about the weight of the spacecraft and other parameters. They thought these were inflated data. But it turned out that the Soviets had indeed technologically leapfrogged. From declassified documents, there is even that very drawing made that night. But how did it happen that the USSR, which was always lagging and copying technologies, suddenly leaped forward? Honestly, Stalin was only interested in weapons. Therefore, if not for his death, Korolev would hardly have been able to persuade the leadership to launch the first artificial satellite. Khrushchev, on the other hand, was simply obsessed with catching up with and overtaking the USA. By the way, the USA announced their first satellite launch back in 1955. They boasted in advance that they would do it in three years, which only spurred the Soviets to mobilize efforts. They learned from the example of the Soviet Union that it is necessary to act, not just talk. The whole world really didn't expect the USSR to start technologically bypassing other countries. But on October 4, 1957, when the first artificial Earth satellite in human history was launched into orbit, everyone was convinced of the USA's lag. This satellite was in the form of a metallic sphere about 2 feet in diameter and weighing 183 pounds. It was launched on the R-7 launched vehicle. If anyone thinks it was something like a cannonball, they're mistaken. In essence, Sputnik 1 was the world's first device for studying the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere and the propagation of radio waves. I would not say that the USA was so far behind in aeronautics as they launched their satellite a year later, on January 31, 1958. Incidentally, in the same year, that very Soviet Sputnik 1 burned up in the dense layers of the atmosphere. That is, it remained in Earth's orbit for a whole year, making 1,440 revolutions. Talking about the first human flight, ideally I should immediately talk about the result. But many do not understand that at that time, scientists found it difficult to understand whether a human being could withstand overloads, weightlessness and cosmic radiation. Therefore, it was necessary to conduct the corresponding experiments. Few people know that the first creatures launched into space were flies. They were sent to an altitude of 68 miles in 1947 and returned back. This allowed scientists to find out the impact of spaceflight on a living organism. Later, animals were launched into space. Americans launched monkeys and Soviets – dogs. Both sides had many unsuccessful launches with fatal outcomes. From the American side, the first time they managed to return a monkey alive was in 1959. From the Soviet side, the famous dogs Belka and Strelka were returned alive to Earth in 1960. And just a year later, the first human in history, Yuri Gagarin, was launched into space on April 12, 1961. He stayed in space for 108 minutes before successfully landing unharmed. In the same year, Americans also planned to launch the first human, but they were a month late. Thus, the race was very fierce. At stake was not only the reputation of the state, but also the socio-political system they represented. Interestingly, it really worked. After this event, there were indeed many supporters of the USSR and critics of the USA, even among Americans. It's often more useful to learn about failures than victories. In the lunar program, Korolev made a crucial mistake that effectively doomed the program. This mistake was his refusal to conduct phase testing. This meant that the entire project was developed from start to finish and then launched. Previously, this approach was justified because rocket designs were simpler, but to send a human to the moon required a more complex and powerful rocket. But Korolev thought he would succeed, as in the lunar program they were already ahead of the Americans. Before the USA, they launched the first automatic station Luna 2, which was the first in human history to make a flight from Earth to another celestial body, delivering pennants with the symbols of Soviet Union to the moon. And Luna 3 was the first to photograph the far side of the moon. Everything can go wrong when you are blinded by success and don't listen to your colleagues. A design for the carrier rocket was chosen that initially didn't have the right characteristics for the successful implementation of the project. Korolev rejected Glushko's proposal, the idea of creating a new type of engines operating on heptil. This is an extremely toxic fuel, but it has advantages such as high density, self-ignitability, high energy characteristics and a much simpler design of fuel equipment was required. But Sergei Pavlovich insisted on the old design of oxygen-kerosene engines. Incidentally, Glushko later, after Korolev's death, still created engines operating on the fuel he proposed. Based on these engines, proton rockets were created, which successfully served many years later. 
These same engines were used to launch blocks of the Salute and Mir space stations into orbit, as well as interplanetary probes of the Luna, Venus and Mars series. But Korolev insisted on his approach, which led to the rockets exploding one after another. This resulted in huge expenditures of money and time. Korolev was married twice in his life. The first time he married Ksenia Vinogradova, whom he met in the institute in Kiev. They married in 1930, and a year later their daughter Natalia was born. In those years, if you were sentenced for political reasons, often all relatives would abandon you. His wife was no exception. The same year he was arrested, they divorced. The second time he married in 1946 to Nina Ivanovna, who worked as a doctor at the research institute where Sergei Pavlovich conducted research. They had no children together, but lived together until his death. The torture and harsh life during Korolev's imprisonment did not pass without a trace. Naturally, it greatly undermined his health. He had a whole host of illnesses. On December 3, 1960, Korolev suffered his first heart attack. That is, this event alone could have ended Khrushchev's plans to launch a human into space before the Americans. Sergei also had a kidney disease. Doctors warned that he needed to reduce the intensity of work. But Sergei Pavlovich was convinced that the entire space program relied only on Khrushchev's desire to outpace the USA. Therefore, he was in a hurry and did not spare his health. In 1962, he had an attack of intestinal bleeding. In 1964, he was diagnosed with cardiac arrhythmia, which resulted in him spending 10 days in the hospital. He died after intestinal surgery on January 14, 1966. A cancerous tumor was removed, but his heart could not withstand the strain. Rocketry was one of the few areas where the USSR significantly outpaced the USA, and this likely would not have happened without enthusiasts like Korolev and Glushko. That's all for now. Bye-bye.